It might go without saying, I'm horrified by the recent events in this time in our history. There is this global pandemic that continue, continues to claim the lives of so many and has made others dreadfully sick. There are increasing job losses, businesses that are going under due to the financial downturns of this time with significant loss of income to individuals and families. There is an increase in mental health issues nationally and globally. Our streets are filled daily with peaceful protesters, often turning violent into destructive street damage. There is a perpetuation of white supremacy, which if you look historically, was laid to rest in 1865, 155 years ago, which yet today continues to lift its prejudice head. And this, maybe more than anything else I have mentioned, I'm horrified when I realize again that I, have not done enough to confront the pressing issues of racism and injustice in my own heart and within my own community. Perhaps too, it goes without saying that I believe, and I mean each of us, are created in the very image of God. We are loved equally by God Therefore, we are responsible in any way that we are able to love and to protect each other, regardless of skin color, of nationality, of religious views, of socioeconomic levels, and all the other means by which we tend to characterize or dismiss those whom we consider to be unlike ourselves. So this morning I begin with a lament-filled prayer. This is an excerpt from Psalm 51. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Just a few minutes ago, you heard some statistics describing who our closest neighbors are, those who are residing with us in Berks County. There are many around us, as you well know, right here in our home, whose lives consist of one prolonged day of trouble. Samuel Sarpia, a pastor from South Africa, came to the United States to attend our Brethren Seminary, Bethany, in Richmond, Indiana, then went on to pastor an inner city church near to Chicago. Later, he was elected moderator, the highest elected position in the Church of the Brethren, and served as moderator in 2018. You may remember him. Samuel reminds us that we, the stateside churches, should continually be asking, who is our neighbor? He reminds us too that white supremacists are our neighbors, that protesters are our neighbors, that people who are difficult to love reside on the same streets where we live. They even move in next door to us. There are many challenges beyond the obvious of finding ways to respond in Jesus' name in these times. Samuel then asks us a second question after asking us to define who our neighbors are. This is his second question. How then do we respond to our neighbors? 
He asks us, are we better when we believe racism is wrong, but then stay home? Are we excused when we see the violence and the sin and walk right on by, just like some did in the story of the Good Samaritan? These are some of the most difficult questions that beg us as a church community to both lament and to stand firm in our faith. It encourages us to take action in good conscience on behalf of those without a voice being heard. God's word, of course, has shown us what is good. The Lord God has told us what is right and God demands, see that justice is done. Let mercy be your first concern. Humbly obey your God. I believe that most of us deep down inside want to be more like the Good Samaritan. But we're reminded that it's not enough just to read the parables of Jesus or to listen to the prophets of old like Micah. Instead, we must find ways of connecting the words of our faith with our actions. We must also deeply acknowledge honestly the ways in which we are complicit with or make excuses for the powers and the principalities the ways that we have benefited and continue to benefit from injustice in our nation, in our communities, and in the world. Galatians 3 reminds us there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is no male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. As you know, the Church of the Brethren has long held to the values of standing in solidarity with those who are discriminated against or brought low. Rather, we as a denomination must recommit ourselves to become better informed about issues such as racism and to build authentic relationships within our own neighborhoods. As a church, we seek to live out the love of Christ for the whole world. That statement was reaffirmed in 2018 by the annual conference. So my message to you this morning, I think, is twofold. First, we need to recognize and we need to acknowledge all that is wrong. We must again begin the process of helping to heal those wrongs in every way possible. We might begin by creating space for healing and for honestly acknowledging the hurts of others in this world in these days. We also can acknowledge the deep fear and address the anger and the rage of people of color in our communities in the face of continuing violence against them. We can, of course, be in prayer always for officers of the law whose job and whose pledge it is to protect and to guard all human lives in lawful ways. We can give voice to the pain, to our own sense of not always knowing how it is best to respond. We might follow Jesus' example and rightly weep over the things that have made him weep. And the second message this morning is that we are to remember always as the gathered body of Christ that God is always a God of new beginnings, that through God, all things are possible. Victor Frankl was a former prisoner 
in a Nazi prison camp and shares this story. As a longtime prisoner in a barbaric concentration camp, he found himself stripped to naked existence. His father, his mother, his brother, and his own wife died in camps or were sent to gas ovens. So that except for his one sister, his entire family perished in these camps. How could he, with every possession lost, with each value destroyed, in the midst of suffering from hunger and cold and brutality, hourly, minute by minute, expecting his own extermination. How could he find life worth preserving? He says that it was in one of his darkest moments while digging in a cold, icy trench, as he writes, that in a very last violent protest against the hopelessness of death, I sensed my spirit piercing through the enveloping gloom. I felt it begin to transcend that hopeless, meaningless world. And somewhere inside of me, I heard a victorious yes in answer to my question of the existence of an ultimate purpose. He says then at just that moment, a light was lit in a distant farmhouse, which stood there on the horizon as if it were painted for him in the midst of a miserable gray dawning of a cold morning in Bavaria. You, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and hide it under a bowl. Instead, we put it on a stand and it gives its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, we are to let our light shine before others that they may see the good deeds around them and add glory to God in heaven. In these modern days of trouble, we too are called and encouraged to be sources of hope, sources of peace, sources of comfort, sources of light in the face of fear, in the face of lament, in the face of uncertainty. And I would pray that we as a church community may find ways of reaching out, stretching ourselves far beyond our own fears and our own feelings of limitations to be love at work in the world and in our neighborhoods. There is so much that we can do in small and large ways to hate what is wrong and to work from living, loving, God-inspired hearts in response to these days. I pray that it's so. Amen.